Boston, Massachusetts, 1920. A brash and colorful Italian immigrant, Charles Ponzi, promises investors that he can give them a 50% profit on their money in 45 days, or double their money in 90 days. He explains his idea, an arbitrage in the foreign exchange markets, which seems low risk and highly profitable. And unlike most con men, it appears that he may well have believed in his own scheme. Over a period of slightly less than a year, he will cause financial calamity in Boston, cause multiple banks to fail, and his name will go down in history as the most famous con man to ever exist. Today, New York and London do battle to be the global center of finance, and Wall Street in New York is without a doubt the center of finance in the United States. But this was not always the case. Originally in the United States, Philadelphia was the financial center, but by 1920 it had slipped and it was a toss up now as to whether Boston or New York were the center of finance in the United States. Charles Ponzi arrived on the scene in Boston at the perfect time for a man like him. To his admirers he was a financial genius and to his detractors he was a fraud. His incredible rise would mark the first roar of the Roaring Twenties. The core idea that Ponzi came up with was actually a fairly smart idea that he stumbled across. But as you'll learn, he actually never got around to pursuing any real investments as he was just so busy running his scheme, taking in money, paying it out, talking to the press and shopping on Newbury Street. The thing that really makes this story so interesting is that it's an unsolvable puzzle trying to work out what kind of a person Ponzi actually was. Was he smart or was he a fool? There are things that he did that a total fool could not have done. He did actually come up with a kind of smart investment idea, albeit one that could not have been run on any real scale. And equally, he was able to manage the logistics of a business with numerous employees and open branch offices all around the country that grew at a phenomenal rate. In addition, he must have been an amazing salesperson. We have to remember that all of this took place over around six months. Ponzi clearly got a lot done in that short period of time. On the other hand, it would appear that he was maybe not that bright a guy in that he seemed to fall for his own trick. He appeared to believe in himself right up until the end, and he didn't seem to understand that there was no real way that any of this could work out for him or for anyone involved. The world, and the United States in particular, had changed a lot in the years leading up to the early 1920s. America was now a prosperous country, where the idea that a penny saved is a penny earned had disappeared. Money was to be made fast, easy, and in large quantities. The newspapers of the time were filled with stories of vast fortunes being made by entrepreneurs, stories of young girls marrying rich men, and people inheriting huge fortunes from long-lost relatives. Prosperity was no longer the preserve of the well-born. Now everyone could become rich. If money didn't come fast enough, you had to just go out and grab it. For promoters of get-rich schemes, this was the time to think big. It was a similar time to the tech boom of the late 1990s, or the cryptocurrency mania of the late 2010s, but on steroids. So first up, what is a Ponzi scheme? A lot of people confuse the idea of a Ponzi scheme with a pyramid scheme. In a pyramid scheme, participants only make money by recruiting more members. There are many different kinds of pyramid scheme, but the two most basic are product-based and so-called naked pyramid schemes. In a naked pyramid scheme, no product is sold. With a product-based pyramid scheme, the concept is the same, but it is disguised as a legitimate direct sales opportunity. In either case, a pyramid scheme usually involves each person recruiting 10 additional people who usually have to pay some sort of initiation fee, let's say $100, and then they have to find 10 additional people. It sounds simple enough, but here's the problem. Let's say the initial 10 recruits each find 10 more people. 
Those 100 recruits will then have to find 10 recruits each to make $900. That means they have to find a thousand people willing to sign up for the program. And if they somehow do find a thousand people, that next level of the pyramid will need to sign up 10,000 people to make a profit. Eventually, there won't be enough recruits at the bottom of the pyramid to support the level above it. That's when the pyramid topples and everyone at the bottom loses their investment. Once you get about 10 layers down the pyramid, you exceed the entire population of the planet. A Ponzi scheme is quite different to that. And what makes it fascinating is that it's usually all about one person. Usually a tremendously charismatic and tremendously interesting person who can convince people that you can trust them with all of your money and all of your family's money and that they can return it to you with an enormous interest rate well beyond what a reasonable person might expect, usually in a short period of time. In Ponzi's case, the promise was to double your money in three months. It was not a scheme invented by Ponzi, but it was a scheme that he mastered. Before his scheme broke and was all over the global press in 1920, the scheme was known as robbing Peter to pay Paul. Ponzi was not taking all of that money and blowing it on a lavish lifestyle as you may expect, although he did use some of it that way. He was taking the money, setting it aside, and when an earlier investor came in to collect their initial investment, plus the 100% return, he would give the new investor's money to the old investor. So the scheme involves paying the early investors out of the money that comes in from later investors. The money just churns in and out until the scheme eventually goes bankrupt. Usually the goal of a Ponzi schemer is to attract enough money from new investors until you have a huge pile of money and then you can skip town and live off your ill-gotten gains. Take the money and run, basically. As you will see, that's not what Charles Ponzi ended up doing. In fact, it would appear that Ponzi possibly never intended to do anything like that. He had a huge belief in his ability to make money with a variety of investment schemes that he was constantly dreaming up. And he seemed to believe that he could pay off all of his investors and become hugely wealthy himself. He just needed time. The core idea that Ponzi came up with was actually a fairly smart idea that he stumbled across. But as you will learn, he never really got around to pursuing any real investments, as he was so busy running his scheme. In order to understand Ponzi, we must first understand the world in which he lived. 1920 was a remarkable time in America, a time of true change and the dawn of the modern world. World War I had just ended, and people had suffered through the deprivation of war and felt that it was now time to get rich, to have fun and to party. Prohibition was in effect, but prohibition had a funny effect on the American people. Instead of improving the morality of the country, as one might have expected, prohibition instead made it feel okay for people to break the law. It undermined the values of Americans who were normally law-abiding citizens. Because prohibition was so widely broken, people began questioning which laws it made sense to abide by and which ones were there to be broken. There was actually a huge spike in crime over the years of prohibition in the United States. All kinds of seemingly amazing, almost magical technologies had been invented in recent years. Aeroplanes, automobiles, and the inventors of these technologies had become wealthy beyond belief. The stock market was ramping up, companies were all making money, and the hardship of the Great War was well in the past. There was a boom in immigration and cities like Boston and New York were filled with new and different immigrant groups with very different ideas. Some were viewed as anarchists and there was a lot of chaos. Women had just gotten the right to vote in August 1920. 
For the first time in American history, there were more people living in cities than farming in the countryside. It was a time when money became a driving force in American life, more so than at any time in American history. Charles Ponzi was born in Lugo, Italy in 1882, to a family that was rich in name only. All of his mother's family had Don or Donna in front of their names, which tied them to the Duchy of Parma. So they were Italian aristocrats, but by the time Charles was born, the money was all gone. When Charles was born, his father was working as a postman. His mother, Imelda Ponzi, clung on to this aristocratic heritage, and as Charles would say, she spent his whole childhood spinning castles in the air. She would tell him how he was the one who would restore the family name and lift them back up to their rightful position in society. That idea stuck with him his whole life. It stuck with him long after his scheme had collapsed. Some of his mother's ideas really went to Charles's head and using his family's meager savings, he attended the University of Rome. It's worth noting that at the time, less than 5% of the population attended university at all, unlike today, where one in three Americans has a bachelor's degree. So this was quite an opportunity that his parents had given him, a true ticket to the upper class. Instead of studying at the university, Charles spent his days in cafes, he drank and gambled his nights away with a group of young, wealthy, aristocratic students. He bought expensive clothes and refined his tastes attending the opera. He would pick up restaurant tabs for his friends and the pretty girls that they met when they were out. And he quickly ran through all of his family savings, trying to impress people and seem wealthier and better bred than he actually was. In desperation, his family scraped together their last scraps of money, around $220, gave him $200 in cash and spent $20 on a first class ticket on a ship to Boston. Ponzi knew that he had disappointed his mother, but he was sure that he would make his fortune in America. On the ship, Charles carried on as normal, however, and by the time he arrived in Boston, he had gambled away the $200, which was supposed to get him started in the new world. His family, having foreseen this, had prepaid for a train ticket from Boston to Pittsburgh, where he could stay with a relative. Being out of money, he couldn't even get a cab to the train station and ruined his fine clothes walking through the mud from the port. Charles was off to a poor start. He found a few odd jobs, waiting tables and things like that, and traveled up and down the east coast of the United States, doing his best to become rich. He still held on to his mother's dream that he would bring back the family's good name. After a while, Charles washed up in Montreal, Canada, and found a job working at a bank called Banco Zarossi. By this time, he was using the name Charles Bianchi. Banco Zarossi was run by a colorful Italian named Luigi Zarossi. Canada was in the midst of a wave of immigration from Italy, and all of the poor Italian laborers needed a safe place to keep their wages and a way of sending some money back to their families in Italy. But the big banks were not interested in these small accounts. It's worth noting that there was already an Italian bank in Montreal that was serving these customers. So Zerossi, in order to compete for accounts, would offer a much higher interest rate. At the time, the other bank would pay 2% interest, which means that they would take the money in, invest it in Italian securities that paid 3%, and that 1% difference was their profit. Zerossi started paying depositors not just the full 3% interest available through investing in Italian securities, he also paid an additional 3% as a bonus. So the customers were getting a return of 6%, which is about triple what they could have earned elsewhere. Asked how he could do this, Zerossi explained that the greedy bankers at other firms were just ripping off their customers, and he was simply sharing the bank's earnings fairly with his customers. 
This was a line that Ponzi would later use when he was quizzed by reporters in Boston about his scheme. Of course, how this all worked out was that Zerosi was unable to pay these high interest rates and quickly started using one customer's new deposits to pay out another customer who was withdrawing money in what was at the time known as a robbing Peter to pay Paul scheme. As long as more money kept coming in than was going out, customers didn't notice and they were just delighted to be getting such high returns on their savings. In 1908, Less than a year after Ponzi had come to work for him, Zerosi packed a bag full of money and fled on his own to Mexico, leaving his whole family behind. Ponzi made a terrible mistake. He forged a check to have some traveling money. He was caught almost immediately when he arrived home after buying a new wardrobe of clothes. He was then sent to prison for more than two years. As soon as he got out of prison, he decided to help some other Italians who didn't speak English who were trying to cross the border into the United States, and Ponzi got caught once again. His claim was that he was just helping them out as a translator and that no money had changed hands. Ponzi, only 17 days out of prison, was sent back to prison, this time in the United States to Atlanta, Georgia where he spent two years for smuggling aliens into the country. The immigrants all testified against him as part of a plea deal, and afterwards all of them were set free. Many men would have been broken by this, but that wasn't the stuff that Charles was made of. When he got out of prison, he heads out to a small mining town in Alabama, and he came up with what seemed to be a very good idea. He decided to start a utility company that would provide water and power to all of the mining towns. It seems like it might have been a good idea and a lot of people claim that it probably would have worked out for him. He was going to sell stock in the company. While he was planning this, he was working as a nurse to make ends meet. He was just about ready to launch this company when he heard about a local woman named Pearl Gossett who had been horribly burned in a kerosene explosion. Pearl needed skin grafts, otherwise she might lose her limbs or she might even die. When Ponzi was told this story, he said to the doctor, how much skin does she need? The doctor said, quite a lot, and Ponzi replied, well, you can take all you need from me. He did not know this woman, but in an act of great generosity donated 220 square inches of skin, which was taken from his back and legs. He would be horribly scarred for the rest of his life over this act. It was a generous and heroic act. The community nominated him for a Carnegie Heroism Prize. Charles was in great pain and battled infections for months after the operation. He spent a total of about four months in hospital. And by the time he got out, another company had been launched to provide electricity and water to the mines. Ponzi had to return to the drawing board. He needed a new idea. It's impossible to know if Ponzi's utility company idea would have actually worked out at all. He may never have been able to raise enough capital. He may never have had the specific knowledge necessary to set up and run such a complicated business like a utility. He possibly didn't have the ability to manage all of the logistics, but the one thing that we can see at this point in the story is Ponzi's entrepreneurial spirit and how he always thinks big. He wasn't planning on opening a grocery store or working his way up at one of the mining companies. Instead, he planned on launching a power and water utility, a major type of business that would have been quite high tech at the time. We're also able to see a lot of the contradictions in his character at this point in the story. There are numerous stories of his generosity throughout his life, stories about how he would maybe pick up the tab at a restaurant when he went out with his friends and return home and have no money to pay the rent for the rest of the month, or how he would walk by an ice cream store, see children outside and go inside and buy ice cream for the whole crowd. 
He had this unusual character. He wasn't an obvious greedy villain, and this is kind of what makes the story so good. The fact that he had this huge contradiction in his character means that we can't just look at him and see a simple con man and swindler. He was much more than that, and it's really a struggle to understand what he was trying to do or what was possibly going through his head at really any point in this story. Ponzi, once again down, but not out, headed back to Boston in 1917. And at this point, his luck finally seemed to change. His first bit of luck would be meeting Rose. Rose Gineco was the Italian-American daughter of a fruit merchant near Faneuil Hall in Boston. She was a beautiful girl, about 17 years younger than Charles, and Ponzi fell madly in love with her, and Rose fell madly in love with him. Rose loved him, and based on their letters, it's clear that all she wanted was Charles Ponzi. She just wanted a small home, children, and a humble lifestyle. But Ponzi transferred all of his dreams onto her, his dreams of great wealth that he had inherited from his mother. He wanted to buy furs and jewelry for Rose. He wanted her to live in a huge house with servants and chauffeur-driven cars. He would tell Rose of all of his dreams and explain his complex money-making plans and describe the lavish lifestyle they would live together. And Rose would listen politely and remind him that she did not need money to be happy. Ponzi went back to his old ways, doing everything he could to get rich. He even took over his in-law's fruit business for a while, but that didn't work. In truth, the business was already on the rocks, and Ponzi tried to turn it around, but it failed through no real fault of his own. After the Gineco family fruit stand had gone bankrupt, Ponzi took his last savings and rented a small office in downtown Boston, on the fifth floor of 27 School Street, the Niles Building, which is still there today. And it was here that Ponzi came up with his big idea. Ponzi could just about afford his office rent, and he could not afford furniture. So he went to a local secondhand furniture dealer, picked out around $350 worth of furniture, and then struck a deal with the owner, Joseph Daniels, that he would put $50 down and pay $5 a month for the furniture. Ponzi planned, at first, on running an import and export business, where he would help international companies trade across borders. But because he had no contacts of his own, he looked into advertising in foreign trade magazines. When Charles saw how expensive the advertising would be, he changed his plan and decided to open a magazine of his own and sell advertising. He would call the magazine Trader's Guide, and print it in multiple languages. He would mail the magazine out for free and sell advertising in it. He quickly found himself unable to come up with sufficient editorial content to fill a whole magazine, and he was also unable to sell enough advertising. Trader's Guide was about to go bankrupt before even publishing its first magazine. Sitting in his office alone, Ponzi leafed through the mail and saw that he had received a letter from Spain requesting a copy of the magazine. Enclosed in the envelope was something he had never seen before, a postal reply coupon. Ponzi held the coupon in his hand and felt that his whole life had led him to this point. This was how he would become rich. So what was it that Ponzi found so interesting in this coupon? Ponzi realized that this coupon was possibly the only form of international currency in the world. In 1906, 63 countries had gotten together and they came up with these coupons as a way to make it easier to send mail across national borders. The coupon allowed a person in one country to send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to a person in another. Before these coupons, it was close to impossible, except at prohibitive expense to do such a thing. These coupons have value in almost every country in the world. 
but its only value, however, is to buy stamps. Now, if you remember, World War I had just ended. After the war, certain countries' currencies had moved significantly in value since this deal had been struck in 1906. A number of European currencies had plummeted over that period. So it was possible to go to Europe, buy a dollar's worth of these coupons, and return to the United States and buy five or ten dollars worth of stamps. This is what traders refer to as an arbitrage, an opportunity to make a risk-free profit. The main problem that Charles faced was that you could not turn these stamps back into dollars. You would just have to buy stamps and then sell those stamps. On top of that, back then it would have been expensive to travel back and forth with all of these coupons. Nonetheless, it was a great idea. Ponzi realized that done in enough size, this could make him rich beyond belief. All he needed to do was raise a lot of money, travel to Europe, buy these coupons, bring them back, and somehow convert them into cash. He took this idea with him around the corner to the Hanover Trust Company and asked to take out a loan to do this. The bank's president was quite rude to him and basically threw him out of the office. Ponzi was told that his small account was more trouble than it was worth and that he would certainly not be getting a loan. Charles tried a number of other Boston banks and none were interested. He asked friends for loans, but they were all like him and had no money to spare. So, he made the decision that if the banks would not help him, he would just have to sell this idea directly to the public. Ponzi decided that he could raise money this way as long as he offered people a very high return, as otherwise they would simply invest their savings with more established banks. So what he did was he set up a company and he named it the Securities Exchange Company, or the SEC. Now it is worth noting that this was more than a decade before the Securities Exchange Commission came about in 1932. So while the name sounds quite amusing to modern ears, it would not have been so controversial back then. Ponzi understood that he hadn't figured out the logistics yet. He did know he had a great idea, and it seemed to be both legal and possible to execute. But he knew that it might be difficult. He had to get all of these coupons, ship them back to the USA, and somehow convert them into cash. He had not figured out the details, but he had spotted the opportunity. He felt he could sort out the details over time, Charles must have felt that he might run into difficulties, as he did quite an unusual thing when he incorporated the Securities Exchange Company. He incorporated with three names on the registration papers. He put down the name of John Dundero, his wife's uncle, as the president of the company. John did not know about this and had no idea what was going on. Ponzi also put down his landlord from Parma, Italy's name, Guglielmo Bertoli, who Ponzi knew would have been long dead by this point in time. Finally, Ponzi put down his own name, third on the company registration, and listed his title just as one of the company managers. Ponzi may have expected things to go well, but it appears that he also knew that he might have to evade investors at some point in time and claim to just be an employee. Ponzi started offering what became widely known as Ponzi notes. He told his investors that he would take in any amount of money and pay 50% interest in 90 days. Shortly after that, he changed it to say that he would pay the 50% interest in just 45 days. There was huge and instant demand for these Ponzi notes. One of the amazing things is how quickly this scheme grew and then blew up. Everything happened in less than a year. In fact, about eight months from the first note being issued. But in that time, a huge amount of money came in. Offices were opened all over the United States. 
It's quite amazing to look at what happened and to see how it happened in such a short period of time, almost 100% orchestrated by one man. There was no real team, there were plenty of employees, but just one person at the center of all of this, Charles Ponzi. In the first month of business, Charles brought in around $1,700. By early spring, he was bringing in around $30,000 a week in new investments. In June, he brought in $2.5 million, which in today's money is around $32 million. He had by then opened offices all over New England and was fielding phone calls on a daily basis from all over the country from people asking to be his agent in various cities. There are a few side stories that you notice when looking at Ponzi and his scheme, one of which is that fraud attracts fraud. Other scoundrels noticed what Ponzi was up to and opened an office right next door to him offering the exact same deal. They just took advantage of the huge lines for Ponzi's office. They called themselves the Old Colony Foreign Exchange Company. Ponzi knew that they were frauds and wanted them gone, but there was not much he could do about them. He could hardly call the authorities in and explain what is wrong with the deal they're offering. It's the same deal he is offering. Another problem quickly reared its head. Ponzi had quickly paid off the used furniture dealer, Joseph Daniels, that we mentioned earlier. Daniels, however, a deceitful man, began to notice how busy Ponzi had become. Daniels reasoned to himself that Ponzi must have used a small loan from the previous December to start a successful business. He put it to Ponzi that because of this, he was entitled to more than the repayment he had received. He was in fact a 50% owner in the business. When Ponzi sent him packing, Daniels hired a lawyer and filed a million dollar lawsuit against Ponzi. Daniels' lawyer also filed an attachment against five of Ponzi's bank accounts, freezing about $700,000 of his cash. When news of this lawsuit reached the press, it caused a two-day run on the Securities and Exchange Company. This lingering lawsuit and frozen accounts would continue to cause trouble for Ponzi for months. Towards the end, Ponzi ended up paying Daniels a settlement of $50,000 in order to unfreeze his accounts. Most people in Boston seemed to want to invest at least something. Even people who didn't really believe in the story put a little bit of money in so that they could participate, thinking of it as a lottery ticket. Other true believers put in everything they had, even borrowing money to invest. The note that you see on screen right now was owned by Principio Santisoso, a reporter for the Boston Post. He bought it for $200 in 1920, which is about $2,500 in today's money. Principio invested, but did not write anything about Ponzi in the Boston Post. Not a word appeared in the press about Ponzi for over a month after Principio bought that note. With his bank accounts bulging, Charles went on a shopping spree. He invested some of the funds in businesses, some in real estate loans to friends. He even lent money to friends so that they could invest in Ponzi notes. His biggest and most important investment, however, involved gaining control of one or more banks. Charles started out by making some small investments in a few Boston-based banks. He figured that if he gained control of the banks, he could weather any storms that may arise by using their reserves until he eventually managed to flip his business into being profitable. Hanover Trust was the nearest bank to his School Street office. It had around $5 million in assets. This was the same bank whose president had been rude to him a few months ago when he applied for a loan to start up his trade magazine. Charles planned to take control of the bank and began by slowly buying up blocks of stock as they became available for sale. At the same time, he slowly increased his deposits in the bank, quickly becoming by far their largest depositor. 
Charles then befriended a number of the existing shareholders. Many of them were Italian like him. He even lent some of them money so that they could invest in Ponzi notes. Charles kept money at a variety of banks all over Boston. He had money at more than a dozen banks. But his largest deposits were at the Hanover Trust, around $2.7 million in total. A lot of money for a bank with assets of $5 million. Hanover Trust was planning to issue new stock, around 2,000 shares. Ponzi walked into the bank shortly before the stock issue and asked to speak to the president of the bank. He offered to buy every share of the newly issued stock. The bank president paused, thought for a moment, and then explained that he had to decline this offer. If I sold you all of these shares, when they are combined with your current holdings, you would then be the majority shareholder and have control of the bank. That is just what I want, said Ponzi. The conversation went back and forth, but they were unable to come to an agreement. As Ponzi got up to leave, he stuck his head back into the bank president's office and asked, Do you mind telling me what my current cash balance is here? The president of the bank knew exactly what this meant. He knew that if Charles withdrew his $2.7 million, much of which had been lent out to the bank's customers, that the bank would be insolvent. Hanover Trust quickly agreed to sell him three quarters of the stock that he wanted and give him a board seat, knowing that he would still be a minority shareholder. They also got him to agree to give them 30 days notice in advance of withdrawing any funds, so that they could deal with the request in an orderly manner. The board of Hanover Trust were not aware that Ponzi already had many of the major shareholders in his pocket. Hanover Trust was now the bank of Charles Ponzi. The scene on School Street and Pi Alley, where Ponzi's offices were, were a hive of activity. People stood in line for hours to walk up to the teller window and deposit their money. As time went by and Ponzi showed an ability to pay early investors their principal and interest back, his reputation grew. Of course, many of the investors who were paid their money back quickly reinvested it, often adding additional capital. Ponzi, of course, hadn't yet worked out how to do this trade with the international reply coupons, so he robbed Peter to pay Paul, using the money from later investors to pay early investors, figuring that he could sort out the details shortly enough. Of course, very few people actually took their money out, as they figured they could just wait another 90 days and double their money again. Ponzi not only seemed willing and able to pay people back, but he had his bookkeeper send people postcards a few days before their money became due, in order to remind them to come in and collect their money. It made him look extremely credible to these people, that he seemed to want them to collect their profits. At this point, Ponzi could easily enough have taken the money and run. He had a huge amount of money, it was in banks all over Boston held in his name. Had he taken it back to Italy, the US law enforcement would have been unable to extradite him. At one point, he had bought two tickets back to Italy, one for him and one for Rose, in order to return to Italy to visit his mother and to take the honeymoon they could never have afforded before. He had a certificate of deposit for $1 million that he used to carry around in his suit pocket. He could easily have fled, but he did not. At this point, he was the toast of the city of Boston. He walked around town in the finest of clothes, with a huge diamond tie pin and a gold-handled cane. He was chauffeured in and out of work in a locomobile, which was one of the finest coach-built cars available at the time, the American equivalent of a Rolls-Royce. He had paid $13,600 for it, which when inflation adjusted, comes to around $200,000 in today's money. Ponzi realized that if he left Boston, even just for a short holiday, that people might think he had taken the money and run. 
Instead of taking the holiday, he cashed in the tickets and bought a ticket for his mother to bring her to Boston. Ponzi set about buying a house for himself and Rose, and he looked at some of the finest homes available for sale. Rose wanted none of that. She hated the idea of living in a huge ostentatious house filled with servants, and got him to tone it down to a more modest, but still very impressive home in Lexington, Massachusetts, a short commute to Boston. Charles wanted a mansion for Rose to live in, but she wanted a home, not a big place with great rooms. The house is still there, 19 Slocum Road in Lexington, Massachusetts. In fact, it recently sold, but with no mention of its history in the advertisement. Maybe it was seen as bad luck. There are stories you can find about the hugely expensive renovations that he had done on the home, but these are mostly untrue. It was heated and air-conditioned, which would have been very unusual at the time. Some people describe the home as having huge walls or a fence around it, but once again that is untrue, as you can see from photographs from the time and from today. Charles did not own the home for very long, and Rose was always trying to reduce his spending. Rose was known to frequently return the expensive gifts that Charles bought for her to the stores, as lavish gifts did not suit her thrifty ways. She did not like having servants clean the house, and she always felt that she would do a better job cleaning it herself anyhow. The evidence appears to show that Ponzi had no intention of absconding with the money. He had plenty of opportunity to do so, but he did seem to believe in his ideas, and right up to the very end, he thought that he could turn things around. Around this time, the Attorney General's office began tapping Ponzi's home and office telephones, hoping to hear damaging admissions or clues as to what Ponzi was up to. But other than hearing him discuss his fanciful business ideas, they heard nothing of use. As wild as it might seem, it is quite possible that Ponzi had no idea of how deep he was in. One of the things that differentiates Charles from other con men and Ponzi schemers that came after him is that he appears to have genuinely believed in himself and his business ideas, even though he was doing nothing to bring any of these ideas to fruition. Ponzi seems to have been a combination of a fool and a dreamer. He was not a stupid man, it's worth saying but he did have an insane, deluded confidence in himself and really seems to have believed that things would work out. You will see this more and more as the story goes on. Charles seemed to have this confidence both in his early life and even late in life after everything had gone wrong for him. He never gave up dreaming and he never lost faith in himself. At this point in the story, when huge sums of money were coming in, and he owed even larger sums, it appears that he had full faith in himself and believed that everything was going to work out. It's worth noting at this point in the story that just because Charles didn't necessarily plan on taking the money and running, that in no way absolves him from what he did. At the core of what was going on here was a big lie. And the lie was that he was engaging in a profitable business in international reply coupons. And there was also the lie to his investors that he could easily pay them back the money that he owed them. In the 90s TV show Seinfeld, George Costanza famously says to Jerry when asked how to beat a lie detector test, Jerry, just remember, it's not a lie if you believe it. Of course, in the real world, it is a lie, and we all know that. Ponzi appeared to have all sorts of harebrained investment and business ideas, and we'll get to some of those in a few minutes. But it would appear that he never really lost a night's sleep worrying that everything would fall apart on him. He doesn't seem to believe that at all, even right up to the very end. He appears to have believed in himself and believed in his scheme. He seems to have thought that it would all work out, which does make him a fascinating character. But at the center of everything is still this great big lie. And just because he didn't think of himself as a con man doesn't mean that he wasn't a con man. 
Up until now, everything was going well for Ponzi. He lived a lavish lifestyle, the kind of lifestyle he always felt he deserved. He appeared to be dripping in wealth. He was married to a woman who he was totally devoted to, and she was devoted to him. His mother had just arrived from Italy and could see the success he had made of himself. As the money flowed in, Ponzi dreamed up new ideas of how he would profitably invest it. One of his more harebrained schemes was to buy up a fleet of old World War I ships. He planned on kitting them out like a huge sea-bound shopping mall, and he would send them around the world filled with the finest American goods, and they would dock at ports around the world selling all of these wonderful goods. It would be the biggest import-export business in the world, he told his wife and mother. He felt he could convert all of this debt into equity in this Ponzi company, and he would become a hugely wealthy businessman. As harebrained a scheme as this sounds today, it might have possibly sounded a bit less crazy in 1920, when great fortunes were being made in bootlegging and in stock manipulation by people like Joe Kennedy or Al Capone. The one cloud that was hanging on the horizon at that point was a man named Richard Grozier. Richard Grozier was the editor and publisher of the Boston Post, one of the many Boston newspapers of the day. Richard's father, Edward, had founded the paper, and it was in 1920 the most important newspaper in Boston, which was one of the most important cities in the USA at the time. Richard was Edward's ne'er-do-well son, whose life up until this point had been not unlike Ponzi's. In the way that Ponzi had flunked out of the University of Rome, Richard had lived similarly while at Harvard. The big difference was that Richard had a deep-pocketed and influential father, who was able to fund all of Richard's failures. Edward would write letters to the Dean of Harvard on Boston Post stationery, requesting more and more chances for his son. Under normal circumstances, Richard would have been thrown out of Harvard. He barely attended class and failed to submit papers. He only scraped through and graduated because of the pressure his father put on the college. Richard, at this point, was 10 years out of Harvard and had in no way proved himself. He had moved from job to job at the Boston Post. In 1920, Richard found himself leading the Boston Post because his father had suffered a stroke months earlier, and Richard was filling in for his hospitalized father. This was Richard's moment. In the summer of 1920, he became convinced that the man with the Midas touch, Charles Ponzi, was a fraud. Grozier decided to go after him, and he decided that despite everyone around him believing in Ponzi, the story Ponzi was spinning just could not be true. The first story that appeared in the Boston Post came in July 1920. It took no shots at Ponzi, it just clearly explained what Ponzi was claiming. The journalist visited Ponzi at his house in Lexington and described it. They described the scene on School Street. It was simply a descriptive story. Grozier felt that once the claims were spelled out clearly in black and white, people would quickly realize how ridiculous they were. Ponzi loved the article when he saw it. His favorite part was that right next to the article, on the same page, was an advert for a savings bank offering 5% interest on deposits. The day that the story came out, more people than ever turned up on School Street with cash in hand. They could earn 5% a year at the bank, or double their money every three months with Ponzi. Grozier was enraged when he saw what happened. He had thought that people would easily spot how implausible the story was. Instead, he had just given Ponzi a free front page advertisement. 
Day after day, the Post started publishing articles about Ponzi, explaining how his promises must be false. The Post brought in experts, published cartoons mocking Ponzi, and slowly a few other papers joined in. The other newspapers always let the Post take the lead, as they were afraid of being sued by a wealthy man like Ponzi. Clarence Barron, the publisher of Barron's Financial and the Wall Street Journal, who was based out of Boston, piled on too. He was the most listened to financial journalist of the time. Barron explained in his papers that Ponzi's returns made no mathematical sense. If Ponzi could compound money at that rate, in no time he would have all of the wealth in the world, and somehow all of that wealth would have been stripped from the post office. Barron also pointed out that Ponzi kept most of his money at banks, and he questioned why Ponzi would keep money at a bank if he was able to compound it at the rate that he claimed to be able to. Ponzi fired back with a lawsuit against the Post, telling anyone who would listen that he would soon own the printing presses of the Boston Post once he won his $5 million court case against them. He sued Barron too, saying that he would shortly own Barron's estate in Cohasset, Massachusetts. Once the Boston Post started making noise, some of the regulators got on board. They didn't want to look asleep at the wheel as they had ignored Ponzi up until now. The bank commissioner, the attorney general of Massachusetts, the US district attorney, and the Suffolk County DA all came to examine the Securities Exchange Company at once. The newspaper articles and law enforcement agencies sniffing around were beginning to cause problems for Charles. The bad press caused a run on the Securities Exchange Company. During the run, Ponzi kept his cool. He was happy to pay everyone back. The lines were bigger than ever before at School Street. Some people still investing, but many more withdrawing. Ponzi had to rent additional office space in order to deal with the rush. The streets were filled with pickpockets. There were other people there offering to buy the Ponzi notes at a discount from the people there to redeem. Not only that, but as we explained earlier, fraud attracts fraud. People were turning up with counterfeit Ponzi notes. Ponzi and his clerks knew that these notes were counterfeit, but Ponzi told his clerks to pay out on these notes too. He didn't need to be seen arguing with customers or refusing to pay redemptions. With all of this talk of limitless money being made in international reply coupons, the postal inspector began to get nervous and decided to look into the issue. It barely made the press that summer when a rule was passed at the post office prohibiting the post offices around the country from redeeming more than 50 cents in international reply coupons per customer per day. At 27 School Street, Ponzi felt that if he could sustain this run and survive, he could still make his fortune. This was just a small road bump. One of the small benefits for him was that some of the notes being redeemed had only a few days left to go till the coupon would be paid, and Ponzi did not have to pay any interest on these notes if they were redeemed early. All he had to do was to return the initial investment principal. Around this time, some businessmen from New York approached Ponzi, offering to pay him $10 million for his business. These talks fell apart quickly, as the $10 million payment would only come after the buyer had learned his money-making secret and had earned the $10 million from operating the business. This was not much of an out for Charles. As the lines grew, Ponzi would arrive every day to his School Street office, very conspicuous in his fine clothes and locomobile. He would serve donuts and coffee to the crowd, and he would make them feel at ease. He hoped that the run would end shortly. Each day that Charles survived, the panic weakened, and slowly people started putting money back in. Throughout all of this chaos, Ponzi continued meeting with reporters and telling his side of the story. 
During this period, Ponzi hired a man named William McMasters, a former reporter and publicity man, to help him improve the press he was getting. One evening, while Charles sat chatting with a reporter at his home, his upset wife Rose walked through the room, and when questioned by the reporter, she replied, I would much rather that Charles was a bricklayer working eight hours each day and went undisturbed by anyone on the evenings and on Sunday than to have all of the wealth that he has brought to me. With the regulators circling and the press writing negative articles about him, Ponzi came up with a plan to save his business. He set up a meeting to meet with all of the regulators and law enforcement agencies all at once, accompanied by his lawyer. While not all of them agreed to the meeting, he turned up, explained his postal reply coupon arbitrage, and then negotiated them into an extraordinary agreement. He would open his books to an auditor of their choosing, who would assess all of his liabilities, and only then would he have to prove his assets met those liabilities. At that point, Charles said, they would declare him solvent and all investigations would cease. Ponzi figured that this tactic would keep him in control of his business and buy him some time to make money. On the way out of the meeting, Ponzi stopped and said, it just occurred to me that the auditor's task might be impossible. If I continue issuing notes while my liabilities are being summed up, the task might never be completed. The regulators agreed that this might be a problem and asked if Charles could pause issuing notes while the investigation was underway. I could, replied Ponzi, acting as if the idea had only just occurred to him. It might also give me time to spike certain insinuations that are being made by the press. At that point, he picked up the DA's telephone, called his office on School Street and asked them to stop issuing new notes. Ponzi at this point was happy to no longer be taking deposits, as each dollar that he took put him deeper and deeper into debt. Each early redemption, on the other hand, only involved returning principal without interest. Ponzi had, at that time, around $15 million in liabilities and $8 million in assets, some of which was tied up in various investments, some even being frozen by the lawsuit against him from the furniture dealer. He realized that some early withdrawals which were likely to come in the next few days would help him out, but by his calculations, he would need to show at least $3 million in cash more than he had. His ace in the hole, he figured, was the vault of the Hanover Trust, the bank he had taken control of. He would briefly access the vault, take the cash and securities, pass them off as his own to the auditor, and then return them to the vault with no one the wiser. Things went crazy the next day at 27 School Street, once the press reported that Ponzi was no longer taking deposits and being audited. It was the busiest day ever, with outbreaks of violence, people forcing their way into the office, and the windows and doors getting broken. As Ponzi returned from his meeting with the various investigators, he had dropped into the Hanover Trust Company, the bank that he controlled, and he had given them 30 days notice to withdraw the locked up money he had on deposit there. Unknown to Ponzi, the commissioner of banks, a man named Joseph Allen, whose investigation had so far turned up nothing illegal about Ponzi's banking practices, had grown concerned that there could be a run on the Hanover Trust and on other banks where Ponzi did significant business. He ordered the bank to provide him with daily reports of the bank's financial status, including reserves, deposits, and whether any customers had overdrawn their accounts. Such scrutiny would make Ponzi's temporary bank heist extremely difficult, if not impossible. On Friday, July 30th, the Boston Post had the front page headline, New York Postmaster says not enough international reply coupons are in the whole world to make the fortune that Ponzi claims. 
Grozier's constant hammering away was really beginning to have an effect. McMasters, the publicity man that Ponzi had hired, had begun to grow suspicious of his boss. He worried that if Ponzi really was a fraud, it would harm his career. He did some poking around at the 27 School Street office, collected some evidence and then called the Boston Post. He charged Grozier $6,000 for his story. The next day, the front page of the Post declared Ponzi hopelessly insolvent. McMasters declared that as a public relations man, his first duty was to the public, saying nothing about the money he had been paid for his story. The final nail in Ponzi's coffin, hammered in by the Boston Post, was when Richard Grozier sent a reporter up to Canada to follow up on a tip they had received. The tip was that Ponzi had spent time in prison in Montreal for bank fraud. When they published the story on August the 10th about him having done time for bank fraud, along with his mugshot, the panic intensified. The reporter had walked around Montreal and spoken to old colleagues of Ponzi's from Zerosi Bank. He showed them photos of Ponzi and they replied, yes, that's him, Bianchi. He was positively identified by the prison warden too, who described him as a model prisoner. This story upset Ponzi hugely as he had not told his wife Rose about any of the time he had spent in prison. Rose, however, was not surprised, as before the wedding date, Ponzi's mother had written Rose a letter, letting her know about his two prison sentences. She knew that Charles had not disclosed them to Rose. Imelda had given Rose Charles's side of the story, and Rose viewed the story as more evidence of his good character that he had taken the fall for other people who needed his help. Once that story got out, the game was about up for Charles Ponzi. Ponzi spun a tale to whoever would listen that he had taken the fall to save his boss who had a family and who had been tricked into the illegal act by an extortionist. Within days after his mugshot being published, the auditor finished his work. He calculated liabilities of roughly $7 million. Ponzi realized that he could only show assets of around $4 million at most, even when using trickery to overvalue certain assets. When the time came for Ponzi to seize assets from the vault of Hanover Trust, the state banking inspector had already unwittingly foiled that plan. Ponzi arrived to find the bank had been seized by the regulator and the doors were barred. Rather than be arrested and humiliated in front of his wife and his mother, Ponzi decided to turn himself in. While he disputed the findings of the auditor, he said that he had agreed to abide by them. He was charged initially with mail fraud, a slightly confusing charge as he had only used the mail to notify investors to come in and collect the money he had owed them. More charges would shortly follow. Rose, who didn't claim to understand her husband's business dealings, stood by him. She told the press, I love my husband more than ever. My faith in my husband is as unshaken as it was before. I am rather pleased with what happened today, for it gives me the chance to show the world and to give added evidence to my husband that I love him. On Friday the 13th of August 1920, Charles Ponzi was put in prison, unable to post bail. But that is by no means the end of the story. Charles Ponzi was, as you can see, a man who could take a punch and stand right back up again. Charles Ponzi was sentenced to five years in prison in Plymouth County Jail for federal crimes. In the end, Ponzi had taken and spent around $25,000, not including his home and car, which were sold and returned to investors. This comes to around $400,000 in today's money. The rest of the money was lost due to poor investments and payment of interest to early investors. Charles had expected that to be it, 
But while in prison, Massachusetts state prosecutors continued to press charges against him. In 1922, while still in federal prison, he was back in the courthouse. This time, unable to afford a lawyer, he defended himself. Charles, impeccably dressed as always, shocked the prosecutors by how capable he was at providing testimony and at questioning witnesses over the six weeks of his trial. Ponzi managed to convince the jury to find him and his co-defendants innocent of all charges against him. After four years in prison, he was let out early for good behavior. The state of Massachusetts had not yet given up though, and after being free for three months, Charles found himself back in front of the court on five additional state charges. Once again, Ponzi acted as his own lawyer, and the case ended with the jury deadlocked. The state then tried a third time with new charges, and this time Ponzi's luck was out. The prosecutors had learned from their prior mistakes and were better able to deal with his courtroom tricks. Ponzi was found guilty and sentenced to seven to nine years as a common and notorious thief. He was allowed free on bail while his appeal was pending, and he immediately began plotting his comeback, determined to repay his creditors and regain his fortune. In 1925, while out on bail, Charles Ponzi headed to Florida and assumed the name Charles Borelli. He opened a company called the Charpon Land Syndicate, Charpon from Charles Ponzi. He was offering investors returns of 200% in 60 days, the highest returns he had offered to date. Ponzi bought 100 acres of land, some of which was waterlogged, for $40 an acre. He divided each acre into 23 tiny lots and tried to sell them for $10 each. Each acre he hoped would yield a profit of 500%. Charpon was quickly shut down and Ponzi was sentenced to a year in jail for violating Florida securities laws. Ponzi finally decided to flee the country to avoid his seven to nine year sentence. He faked his suicide and boarded an Italian ship under a false name to work as a dishwasher and waiter. Unable to keep quiet, he foolishly revealed his true identity to a shipmate and the story of who he was traveled like wildfire on board the ship. Ponzi was then arrested in New Orleans when the ship stopped in port before leaving for Italy. So how did things finally end for Charles? Ponzi was released from prison in 1934 and was promptly deported to Italy. He had never gained US citizenship. His wife Rose stayed in Boston and divorced him two years later in 1936 saying she still loved him, but could not remain his wife, knowing that they would never likely be reunited. Charles and Rose, however, continued their love affair, writing back and forth until they died. Neither of them married again or had children. Rose kept all of Charles's letters, which were found by her family after she died. In them, Charles said that he could never marry again, as he believed he was still married to Rose, although he did often try to make her jealous in order to encourage her to come back to him. In 1939, Ponzi moved to Brazil, and while he was always dreaming up money-making schemes, he ended up running a small rooming house. He tried to cash in on his story by writing his memoirs and tried to sell shares in the book to investors at $25 a share, but by then people were no longer interested in his story. In 1948, blind, sick, and in hospital in Brazil, he allegedly came clean to a reporter who visited him. He said that his business had been simple, the old business of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Charles Ponzi died in January 1949 at the age of 66. At the time of his passing, the New York Times said that it was almost possible, though not quite, to believe that he was as credulous as his victims and deceived himself as much as them. 
After the scheme collapsed in 1920, all of the banks where Charles had done business fell under scrutiny from the banking inspector. Along with the Hanover Trust, three other Boston banks failed that September, partially due to bank runs caused by the unwinding of the Securities Exchange Company. It was not just runs on the banks though, some of the bankers in the aftermath were accused of having been so reckless with depositors' money that their behaviour would have embarrassed even Ponzi. What about Ponzi's trade in international reply coupons? In the end it turned out that he had only ever bought $3 worth of international reply coupons from Europe. He had bought $1 worth in Spain, $1 worth in Italy and $1 worth in France. He had done this in the early days of his business as a proof of concept. The French and Spanish deals were awash and the Italian deal was a money maker. When everything was wrapped up, investors who had stayed in Ponzi scheme until the end eventually got back 37.5% of the money they had invested. Many people had borrowed money to invest and ended up losing everything. Others had managed to get in and out and walked away with huge gains. Some of those felt that the money they had made was distasteful and returned it to the liquidator of the scheme. Daniels, the furniture dealer, who had shaken Ponzi down for $50,000, came under scrutiny for his claim that he owned half of the business. He ended up having to return his ill-gotten gains. In the end, Ponzi's name would go down in history, but not in the way he wanted it to. The old scheme of robbing Peter to pay Paul would be renamed the Ponzi scheme. Others would go on to do it on an even bigger scale than Ponzi had, most famously Bernie Madoff. The reason that this story is so interesting is that there are tons of lessons that can be taken away from it. The most obvious one is that if an investment idea seems too good to be true, it probably is. But unfortunately, investors do seem to still make that mistake to this day. But if there is one big lesson here, it is that a good way of avoiding big losses is staying away from any sort of get-rich-quick scheme. There are other lessons here too, though. While Ponzi's life worked out to be a total unmitigated disaster where everything went wrong for him over and over again, usually driven by his deep character flaws, you still do have to admire certain things about him, like his spirit. Ponzi never really gave up, not after failing at university, gambling losses, multiple prison sentences. He just stood up and tried again. And if there's nothing else, you have to admire that about him, his perseverance. Ponzi may have been delusional about his abilities and a fool in terms of finance, but many of his characteristics can be found in some of the most successful people in the world today. He was always looking for opportunities, which is a good thing. He was always thinking big instead of grumbling to people who would listen to him about his current place in society. Instead, he just went out and tried to change his world.